This video is about decarbonizing Dutch energy intensive industry and is part of a project by the Green European Foundation. Industrial emissions account for around 30% of Dutch national emissions, so heavy industry is a crucial sector to address. If the goal is to decarbonize industry, the key word is how. To better approach this question, we use the language of blockers and enablers. We will ask three experts what they think is currently blocking Dutch industry from decarbonizing. But most importantly, we ask them how these blockers can be overcome. What needs to change to enable the decarbonization of heavy industry? But before asking the experts, I'll provide some context. I do this by asking the following questions. What industries emit most greenhouse gas emissions? What are the historical developments in industrial emissions? And what are the most promising technologies? After we've briefly addressed these questions, we'll let the experts shine their light on the issue. So which industries deserve our attention? Looking at Dutch industrial greenhouse gas emissions by sector, we see that the chemical, refinery and basic metals industries together represent around 79% of all industrial emissions. It's for this reason that we'll focus on these three sectors. Although industrial emissions reduced between 1990 and 2010, since 2010, the total level of industrial emissions is quite stable. Absolute decarbonization is only happening marginally. The question arises, what is blocking the Dutch chemical refinery and basic metals industries from decarbonizing? Before we ask the experts, I will say a few more things. A lot is expected from carbon capture and storage, electrification and hydrogen. Although these technologies need to be scaled up first, in theory they can enable a significant reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. But the application of new technologies comes with new challenges, such as a strong increase in electricity demand and the need for new infrastructures, such as for CO2 and hydrogen. So again the question. What is blocking the Dutch chemical, refinery and basic metals industries from decarbonizing? My colleague Evert asked GroenLinks representative Tom van der Lee about his views on the issue. You are the member of parliament, parliament for GroenLinks and greening the Dutch industry, the heavy industry or the energy intensive industry is um, on your agenda. And sometimes I get the feeling that it's one of your favorite subjects, isn't it Tom? Yeah, definitely it is, and because uh, for such a small country, we have quite a lot uh, of uh, fossil industry uh, and one of the main challenges to reach our climate goals is to realize a uh, uh, yeah, transition in uh, the whole of the Dutch industry. From a polit political point of view or perspective, why is it so difficult? What would you say are the main blockers to, to, to green the Dutch industry? Yeah, because the, the main blocker is uh, the, the hard fact that 90% of our energy consumption in the Netherlands is still fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as I said earlier, for a relatively small economy with 17 million people, we have an awful lot of fossil industry because of our geography. Uh, we have uh, the largest harbor of Europe in Rotterdam, and we have several industrial clusters along the coast. Um, so, uh, yeah, for us, it's, it's quite challenging. And we have had a policy for decades by many governments to attract even more industry. Uh, and if you look at the way um, yeah, uh, greenhouse gases are being priced, that's not enough to give enough uh, yeah, uh, incentives to the industry to save energy or to uh, change to renewable energy. So a blocker might be our geographical position or our histories. We're sort of locked in by previous governments. Well, we can't change our geography, but we can change our policy. And uh, due to fiscal and uh, measures and subsidies, we attracted quite a lot of heavy industry. So one of the more important steps is to create a level playing field to mm -hmm. increase energy taxes, carbon taxes here in the Netherlands, even on top of the European emission trading system. Uh, in the next government, for sure, one of, this is one of the few things, things that are really for sure, is that GroenLinks will be in the government, the next government. Um, Are you very 
that it might even be so that you will be the minister of uh, economic affairs or climate and economic affairs. What will be your first um, actions policy. you will take, policy measures you will take uh, for greening the Dutch industry? What would be your favorite? You mentioned uh, CO2 taxes. Texas. Yeah, I think I think the most important step is to put the right price on uh, carbon emission. So we need a carbon tax and even a broader carbon tax than uh, the ETS uh, companies. So we have to look further than that and also think about ways to put a price on carbon in other parts of the economy. Uh, so carbon tax, crucial. I think the second one, and we haven't done enough, is saving energy. Okay? Not using energy is the best say, way to save money and to save the climate. Uh, and I think we have to, through uh, regulations, uh, uh, yeah, enforce the companies to yeah, improve their performance on the, the use of energy, uh, the lack of it. That's even more important. So saving energy, I think, would be my second priority. And the third one is that I would like to see the Dutch taking a lead in uh, hydrogen uh, applications uh, because the only way to make industry uh, carbon neutral is to use hydrogen and there are a, a lot of possibilities here and we have waited uh, quite a long time as Dutch people uh, to adapt to solar energy, wind energy uh, because we were afraid of the, the end, high entry costs. Other countries have taken the lead and costs have reduced and I think we need to take a lead uh, regarding in regarding to hydrogen, and this is crucial to uh, yeah make a sustainable, climate neutral uh, industry here in the Netherlands, but also in the Ruhrgebiet and or, or, yeah throughout Europe. Tom said many things, but I'll highlight just one of his main points. According to Tom, not sufficiently pricing industrial emissions forms a key blocker. Increasing the price of emissions is a logical enabler. This would give industry a strong incentive to make efforts to reduce emissions. As Tom mentioned in the end, the Dutch have waited quite long with choosing for renewable energy development. As you can see in this figure, in 2018 the share of renewable energy consumption was very low compared to other European countries. The Netherlands is all the way on the right side. It's only recently that the development of offshore wind production really took off in the Netherlands. So what needs to be done to avoid such a scenario in the context of heavy industry? We asked independent policy advisor Ton van Drill what he thinks is blocking Dutch heavy industry from decarbonizing. Ton has 26 years of experience in researching the decarbonization of industry. Uh, there, there's no, no, no real uh, solution or choice yet made on uh, which technology should be in place uh, and where they should apply it and in, in how far they should apply it. So uh, that makes industry very uncertain. They want to basically make joint uh, decisions with the government uh, on technology technologies and the government is kind of hesitant and well there's a certain background to that because yeah m m many times uh, economists say that yeah politicians should not decide on technologies that the market should do that whereas the market parties say well this is really a serious decision we have to take for the next uh, 30 or 40 years so uh, it's either uh, uh, carbon capture and storage, or we should electrify, or we should you, turn over to biomass, or we should uh, take on hydrogen. And that is not, you know, we cannot switch easily once this choice is made. And we really need, you know, some vision and support from government on uh, will the infrastructure be there, for instance. And, uh, mm -hmm. and for instance, if we electrify, is there enough to uh, to uh, address the intermittent uh, renewable uh, electricity production, et cetera. So the industry so. needs a sort of a, a long horizon, like 30 years, and the government is sort of hesitant at this moment to, to make decisions. Yeah, about the government things. basically says, yes, that is for the market parties to decide, but it's, mm. it's not a simple market issue where there's lots of choices possible and, and you can gradually go to it because industry is required to make this big 
step forward this big turnover and that's not really you know just to the markets uh, for the markets to uh, to uh, solve so i would suggest that uh, basically uh, together with industry government really makes decisions on which technologies uh, where and when and how much technologies of a certain kind, where should this piece of infrastructure come down? Who would, you know, should use uh, CCS, who should use uh, electrification, who can venture into hydrogen? Of course, that hasn't, doesn't have to be, you know, uh, carved in stone, but uh, basically it, uh, I mean, these directions, uh, are required to uh, to really take these steps forward. And so you, you might wish the government wisdom and courage to tackle this and to make those decisions, or is it understandable that they're hesitant and it, it takes time? It is understandable, uh, as I said, because this uh, economic argument uh, is, is very uh, is very prominent still in, in, in departments of finance and economics. Mm -hmm. So it, it really, you know, it it you have to really cross certain uh, thresholds there, mm -hmm. and uh, of course there are basically also. In the background, competitiveness uh, issues uh, once you uh, decide on certain technologies. But uh, I think we have been deciding on technologies for quite some time, and uh, I think there is a good example also. The G Dutch government has uh, taken, uh, you know, the initiative uh, back then when uh, offshore wind uh, parks. Uh, should have been planned and they really took the initiative together with the uh, grid company and that really worked out far, fairly well uh, i mean on the ministry they were quite uh yeah satisfied that this uh, worked out so well and uh, incurred a large uh, for instance a large cost decrease so it's time to you know take this success story a step for further and uh, you know put it to, to work onshore Mm -hmm. And then might it be hydrogen or other techniques? Those are the kind it of is a mix, of course. But uh, and and since it's a mix, and government says yes, we need all these technologies. You know, you have to take it a step further and say, okay, so which technology, where, and to what extent? You know, what is the diameter of this uh, this hydrogen pipe, or what is the you know the capacity of this cable, and uh, who should use it and you know that is not a game that you you know should end up uh, in a in a market situation and there because uh, yeah it, it is uh, often they say it's a chicken and egg problem uh, so not an industry an industry will not decide for a certain technology once uh, and uh, uh, you know first a government should decide uh, if this is uh, viable in, you know, mm -hmm. in uh, in multiple ways viable. So industry becomes confident to really take this step, and they are not confident yet. The uncertainty is too large still, and that's crazy. uncertainty is a mantra that is uh, currently heard very much uh, from from the side of the industry. Uncertainty is the key word here, according to Ton. Industry is waiting for the government to take away uncertainty. Ton clearly calls for stronger government intervention, instead of leaving everything up to the market. At last, Evert had a conversation with Marjan Minisma. Being the director of Urgenda, Marjan won the climate law case against the Dutch government. This forced the Dutch state to reduce emissions by at least 25%. But Urgenda hasn't only filed a law case against the Dutch state, they also developed a vision on how emission reductions can be achieved in practice. Among the many ideas and proposals, Marian will explain a potentially revolutionary idea to decarbonize industry. Uh, it will take time. Uh, in some cases you need space. Mm -hmm. So if you, for example, um, want to make steel and chemistry at the same time energy neutral, you would actually need them together mm -hmm. so that the coal monoxide which is coming out of the steel industry is led to the chemical industry because for them it's one of their building blocks. Mm -hmm. So then you need to, um, well, 
move the chemical industry to a new place. So that might be a, a blocker because that is a big investment decision yeah. and you need enough space and you need governments that give the um, um, permits to have your chemical factory over there and so on. But that would be one of the better ways to do it because then you really have an, uh, an industrial cluster which um, helps each other. And I think that that's the way to go. Yeah, I think you call it in your book a uh, symbiotic industry. Yeah. Um, so a blocker here is um, the lack of infrastructure, more or less. Yeah, or the will, the will to uh, move to another place mm -hmm. um, or the permits that you need from a government. And mm -hmm. it takes often years before a government yeah. gives a permit for a new industry. Yeah. So, yeah, they can, they can all be blockers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, I heard once um, an, uh, uh, about Camelot, which is a large chemical um, cluster in the Netherlands, um, and then uh, we're in a group discussion with a lot of people from the industry, and then someone from uh, Tenet, which is the what the yeah what do you call this the they have the backbone for uh, high for electricity in the Netherlands, and they said yeah well if they want to do Camelot on Camelot if they want to do an experiment with the processes which are uh, based on electricity and not on fossil fuels. Yeah, then we need to, have to, to give them a line, so to speak. We need to give them the, the, the infrastructure to do so. And this might take 10 or 12 years because of... Uh, so, so if we wait for an, exper for an experiment, we're not going to do this because it's, yeah, it takes too much time because of the, the legislation and all the procedures, etc. But in the meantime, the ice is melting. So how can well, we... What yeah, if you would look at it from um, a rational perspective, then such a cluster of Camelot uh, would normally be placed at the sea, where you mm -hmm. can have the wind turbines to get your electricity quickly to this industry, and you would put them close to the steel industry, so you can have this industrial symbiosis. Mm -hmm. So they are actually in the wrong place. Yeah. But there's a lot of lobby to keep them there. Yeah keep the jobs and so on and yeah. so on so say lobby for other reasons is also a, a blocker yeah. that would um, lead to maybe suboptimal solutions marianne clearly explained that ideally the steel and chemical industries are located in the same area so industrial symbiosis becomes an option as this is not the case currently the chemical industry would have to be moved which is a gigantic operation likely to meet resistance. Overcoming this resistance, also in the form of lobby power, would be an important enabler, according to Marianne. So just to sum up, I'll just list here the three blockers and enablers that we've highlighted so far. Um, so to begin with, emissions are at the moment not sufficiently priced, so a stronger CO2 tax would be an enabler here. Secondly, there's a lot of uncertainty for industry, so the government really should take the lead here and not be afraid of making choices. And at last, some industries are located at a suboptimal location within the Netherlands. So moving the chemistry industry close to the steel industry would allow for industrial symbiosis. So this was only a brief impression of our project on greening Dutch industry. There are many more blockers and enablers, which will be discussed in our final report. But for now we say thank you for watching.